holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Holy Spirit, your activity is welcome here. Give us ears to hear and hearts to accept what you wish to say to us through your word this morning. Amen. Can we just cue the uh, PowerPoint? It would be great. Thanks. Thanks very much. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ian. I've been coming to this church probably not as regularly as I should, but I've been coming here for about 30 years. I grew up in a church home, um, Methodist. I saw the light and became a Baptist when I was a teenager. (laughs) And, And I was baptized in 1978 quite a long time ago now, when we were a Baptist. But to be honest, I spent many years not really understanding what a relationship with God really meant or how life-changing that could be. Yeah, scripture tells us that when we accept Christ as our Saviour, God's Holy Spirit comes to live in us. We receive the presence of God in us. We receive salvation because Christ has paid the price for us, paid the price for our sins. We are, from that point, a new creation. But then what? You know, God always intended accepting Christ to be the start of a new journey. A journey hand in hand with the one who made us. A journey that brings hope. A journey that brings wonders. A journey where we see God's kingdom expand in our areas of influence a journey where others are blessed through our words and through our actions, a journey where we hang on to God as he sets the plan and he sets the pace. Jesus said that he came to bring life to the full. I want us to be very honest this morning and I want to be honest with you. Does this sound like your ongoing experience of Christianity? It certainly didn't used to be mine for many years. I remember that first love that I had for Christ when I came to him, invited him into my life way back when I was about probably about 16 and a half, I think. I used to go around full of joy. I told many people at school about Jesus and the hope that I had found. Life was great. Time passed. Life became very busy as life tends to do as we get older, a new husband, a new father, a professional accountant with all that that required. But somewhere in the mix of long hours and busy family life, I forgot about spending time with my heavenly father. I rolled down a a slippery slope. Life got too busy for, for meaningful quiet times with God, or so I thought. 
Church attendance started to become irregular. Passion for God fizzled out. Passion and respect for others started to go away. And to be honest, and Kathy will tell you this, I started to become not a very nice person to be around. Life's pressures started to crush in. Life just became a journey of surviving one day at a time. You know, God never intended life to be like this. Where had I gone wrong? At no point did I doubt God was real, but where was he? I started to search for satisfaction in all the wrong places. But the story has a a happier ending. One day when I was 45, and I, I remember this day well, at a time of crisis when I was deeply depressed, God called out to me by name. I had picked up a very dusty Bible from a shelf at home. I worked on the far side of the city and had left early for work. I guess I was looking for some some final chance of hope. As I stopped in a lonely car park before work, I opened the Bible. And I read of Saul's experience on the Damascus Road where Jesus met him. And I'm sure I heard the words, Ian, Ian, why are you fighting against me? It all changed from then for me. God had called. I heard God's call to walk with him hand in hand through life daily. Today I want to talk specifically about prayer and the need to spend time with our Heavenly Father each day. For in this time spent with God, In this time spent just you and him, here is the source of our lives. This is where our energy comes from, our passion for God and our passion for others. You know, this place, this place of time with God is the place where life makes sense where life seems under control. The challenges of life seem to fade away as Abba says to you quietly, don't worry, I'm with you in all of this. As Erin was saying last week, we need to, to know God to intentionally walk daily through life with him. Talk with him as we move through our day. Listen to him as he speaks to us in a small voice. Jesus taught that we must stay connected to him if we are to be effective. It's only when we stay connected, God's influence can change our lives and we can carry God's presence effectively to others. Bear with me for the technology just a moment. There we go, oops. Sorry, new at this. In John 15, we see recorded as words, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, 
You are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are gathered up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, what, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You know, Jesus in his own time of ministry knew the importance of staying connected with the Father. He would often withdraw from crowds and the demands of ministry to spend time with the Father. Ah, sorry. This passage here from Luke. Yet the news about Jesus spread all the more so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. You know, when Jesus, being as, as a man, required wisdom, he knew where to turn. We read in Luke 6 of, of the time when he came to choosing the 12 apostles. And we read this, one of those days, Jesus went out to, the, to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Just imagine that, the whole, the whole night. I, I've done a, a fair few prayer vigils and the night can get fairly long, but I certainly haven't done the whole night. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. You know, in, in God's word, and, and even right back in the Old Testament, God has given us clear instructions of how he expects us to walk and grow in him, to have effective relationship with him. This, this passage has come up in this church a lot and I, I think still feel God is really saying something to us all, both individually and as a church. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, that, 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 this is in the setting where Israel was sitting in the midst of a famine, a very dry land. They cried out to God and, and God set these conditions that he would heal the land and send the rains. But, but I think... To me, it also speaks of a dry life, an arid place where the, there isn't success with God, you know, where life seems very dry. And certainly, for me, this verse talks to me about my own life as it used to be. So just to, let's expand on, on this passage just a little bit more. I think one of the first things that God calls us to is humility before him. To honour God regularly for who he is, the creator of the universe. We need to declare before him with our mouths, God, you owe me nothing. I owe you everything. You know, as human beings... We were never created to be self-sufficient. We were never designed to be 
self-sufficient, but we were designed as beings to live with God as, as the center of our lives. Humble yourselves. Admit to God that we need him in all circumstances in life. You know, there's an amazing connection that I and others have found, that when we humble ourselves before God, when we reflect on his holiness, a sense of powerful presence of God always arrives. And I found that to be the case wherever I am in life, whatever situation I am in, if I just stop and honour him as creator and think of his holiness, there's a, there's a, a, a feelable presence wherever I am. God calls us to prayer, to spend time in his presence. If we want to stay connected, if we want to feel God is with us in life, then just as Jesus did, we need to make the time to be in God's presence daily. We need to take the time to pray, but we also need to take the time to listen in stillness to what God is saying to us either in a small voice or through others or through scripture. What I want us to do now is, is something a little bit different. I'd like you all to stand and we're going to read some verses out loud. I'm a great one in believing that when we declare scriptures over ourselves, speak them out wherever we are, then this changes our soul, our very soul, I believe. These are some passages which talk about what we should be doing with prayer in all the circumstances of our lives. The first one, so if we can read that with me. Philippians 4, 6, 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 6, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. James 5, 13, 16, the prayer of faith. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Thanks. Have a seat. Fantastic words of, of assurance, but also words for our action to take time before a magnificent God and claim his scriptures as the truth that they actually are. So the question that, that many ask is what makes 
and effective prayer. As we heard in the children's story this morning, it's nothing to do with the words that are spoken. I think the wider church have greatly overcomplicated prayer, the concept of prayer, and put a huge burden and a disbelief on many. That's not about the words. Is it about the person that's praying? Not at all. All people who believe in Christ are equal in God's sight and are equal members of God's family. It's not about the person. I think what moves God to action is the sincerity, the empathy, the emotion about the situation that the person brings to their prayer. Are they before God often and in a broken way about what or whom they're praying for? I think the other thing that matters, and this is my opinion only, it's not from the Baptist Union, is, is the prayer part of a working relationship that you have with God? Or are we just praying using God when the wheels fall off in our lives? Do we look to God as some sort of divine ambulance service or are we walking with him? When, when we seek God, are we really interested in what he wants for us? Do we really want to know what he cares about? Or do we just look to him as an assistant for our plans, some form of divine supermarket? I'm sorry if I'm sounding direct. I, I'm involved in prison ministry, and what you don't do in prison is waffle around with the guys because they'll waffle around with you. You know, the common theme that flows through the prayers of Jesus and is seen in his actions is heartfelt compassion. One of the most revealing verses in the Bible about effective prayer is also the shortest verse in the Bible. And it's found in Luke, and it's found just before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He came upon the mourners of the funeral and it says in this verse, Jesus wept. Interestingly, what we call miracles or God moving often happens in scripture following expressions of brokenness, brokenness before God or compassion. Is prayer always answered? I believe so. But it's not always in the way that we would have liked to see it answered. And it often isn't in the time frame that we would like to see it answered. Yet God's wisdom is far above us. He knows the beginning from the end. And he knows far better than we do what is best for us, what is best for those around us. We need to surrender to that fact that he is God and we are not. You know, Jesus knew that and he prayed accordingly. We think of his prayer at Gethsemane. He didn't want to go to the cross. He didn't want to bear the anguish. And he prayed three times 
God, take this from me so I don't need to go through this. But then what did he pray? He said, but your will be done. He knew of the Father's will. And we read that the angels then, God sent angels to come and attend Christ so that he had the power to make the journey. We can always take good example from the way Jesus lived in his relationship with God. God also calls us to seek his face. And that, of course, can be done through Scripture and needs to be done through Scripture. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, you have the same Holy Spirit residing in you as a believer as inspired men over the years to write the Holy Scriptures, the same Holy Spirit. So that when you read Scripture, the Holy Spirit interprets that Scripture to you. What a blessing to have the Scriptures. Many people don't. We need, need to be in those scriptures daily. Lastly, God gives us a warning in that passage from Second Chronicles about not even dabbling with sin, stuff that we know isn't right. He talks about turning from your wicked ways because he knows what damage it does, and I'm talking from personal experience, what damage it does to our relationship with God. How conflicted we can be when we live for ourselves during the week. We dabble in stuff we shouldn't be, and then we try and do the church thing on a Sunday. And I remember many weeks of sitting here in services in tears, trying to keep the tears back, counting the windows up there, and there are 42 of them, <laughs> as I tried to work out why this faith thing wouldn't work for me. But I had a foot in both camps. A tragedy. I wasted a lot, a lot of time. Let's move on. Okay, so when, when we have made the decision to spend time with God, what, is that, what does that actually look like? There's an amazing film, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, called The War Room. How many, can I have a show of hands, how many of you have seen that film? It's a film about a lady who recognises the need to spend time with her God. She has a special room, her prayer room, she calls it her war room, because that's where she does war on her knees for her own life and the lives of those that she cares about. A designated place without distraction, to pull aside, to spend time with God. The, the walls of that room are covered with prayer requests and, and answers that she's received written, but prayer requests crossed out, and the answers written on, on, the, on the prayer requests. She used to journal what God was saying to her. Here's the interesting part. Her conversation with God was like a conversation between old friends. There were no taboo subjects. The prayer included yelling at God. 
what it brought out was just a merging of hearts. As she and God move through her life together, and we see in the film that many were blessed in the union between this woman and her God. You know, I really do recommend that set place in your homes. I, I have a, a war room at home, modelled, modelled, I guess, or from what I saw in that film. I find it really, really helps where I have this appointment time with God each morning in this place, seeking solitude with the Almighty. It's a place where we seek God's influence and protection over our families, our friends, and others we care about. It's a place where we seek God's will. It's a place where we seek a change in circumstance and in others' attitudes so that we can carry that will out. It's a place where we seek forgiveness for those in our lives we struggle with. We seek blessings for them and we seek wisdom as, how, as to how we should be acting in their presence. Just a, a, a quick little model, is, this, this again is according to me, not to the Baptist Union, um, but it's just a, a model which I, I go through. I think whenever we come to, to prayer, we need to put ourselves in right perspective with God so that we don't fall into the trap of, I need, I need, I need, I need. To take time just to praise God for who he is, to humble ourselves. I've got an acronym there, PRAY. To read scripture, and, and for me that means just reading one chapter a day. What is God saying about himself in that chapter? What is he saying about me? You know, what, what where aren't I doing so well? You know, the changes I need to make. And I fully recommend and suggest a, a journal to write these answers down, to write what the passage is saying about me. I then would pray through what I've written down. God, apply this promise to me. God, help me understand that you are like this. God, help me to change. So I would pray through what I put in my journal, and then I'll pray through the other items that I first came with in my prayer book. Prayer book's a great idea, as you can write down the things for the day, and you can write down answers in the time that follows when the answers come through. Most importantly, every day we're seeking God to be our strength, our guide, and our motivation that particular day. You know, we're, we're looking to have a prayer focus coming back into this church. God said a long time ago, my house shall be a house of prayer for all generations. And you'll see if you look over to the left, your left, that side of the auditorium, we've set up a prayer area which will, will stay there from now on. And it's a prayer area to be used for prayer calls after services. It's also a prayer area where during the day when the church is open, you're invited to come in and pray with a friend or someone in need. Um, it's really good to have a prayer focused both spiritually and physically in a church. There's some anointing oil there 
Um, I'll bring and put some tissues there as well, because it can get messy sometimes. Um, but yeah, I'm, and thank you so much for those who put in the effort into setting that up. We used to have a prayer room here, now we, we have a prayer area, and I, th I think it's great. I, I really do think it's good, because as I wasn't going to get into prayer as a church today, we don't have the time. I can speak about that another time, but prayer needs to be the driving, underpinning statement in all our ministries, all activities of the church. I fully endorse Josh's worship night next week. There won't, there won't be a five o'clock prayer meeting next week. We will be joining with, jo with Josh, with prayer and worship go very much hand in hand. And I'm thrilled and I honour Josh for reaching out to other churches because God is calling the body of Christ to be one, particularly in these last days. So honour you in that, Josh. I really do. I shared earlier about the emptiness, the sadness, the lack of life in Christ that I experienced when I forgot to spend time with my Heavenly Father each day. And I sense that God might be speaking to some of you about that today. There might be some who can't find the spark in their faith, who feel distant from God. You know, it's funny, we, we, we come to church and, and I used to think that everybody had it down pat and I was the only one who was in agony and it wasn't working. I'm a bit older now with grey hairs and I realise that that's not the case that um, people are very, can be in very different places with God or, or indeed, although they're saved, although they've invited Christ, they're really life's on top of them. If you're feeling burnt out by life, if you're feeling controlled by the rat race of human routine, it's time to stop. It's time to reconnect with Jesus as you seek him daily. If you do, I can honestly say this will give you life as you've never known it. It will give you peace in all circumstances as we read in those verses before. You know, it's never too late to change, to run back to the Father, to restart, to earnestly seek him again. Paul says in Philippians 3, forgetting what is behind and straining on towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Man, for me that verse has been and is so liberating. You know, where I can say to God, I've stuffed up, I didn't get it, but from today, from today, you and I are getting closer. Forget what's behind. God calls each of us today to come to intimacy with him as the basis, as the backbone of our very existence. If God is tapping you on the shoulder, if he is calling your name, if he's saying it's time that you and I need to spend more time together, 
I would really encourage you to say, yes, Lord. First, to do so is to choose growth in God. To do so is to start knowing true life. You know, if you want to talk to someone about a decision like that, if you want to talk to someone about recommitting to do that, I invite you to come forward as as we're going to bring the service to a close. We're going to have the benediction now in the children's activity packs um, that Kathy was speaking about, they were doing a, a, a hand, and in the centre of the hand was the Lord's Prayer. So we're going to stand together. We're going to to um, we're going to recite the Lord's Prayer together as our benediction. I felt that was really fitting today, given the subject matter. Now this this will look a little different. It's from the Good News version. Um, so we'll need to read it together our father in heaven may your holy name be honoured your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day the food we need forgive us the wrongs we have done as we forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. Do not bring us to hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. May God bless you in this week ahead. I I really do issue a challenge, I guess, for the rest of October. It might sound like a lot, but it, it 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 will blow you away and bring you to life. And the challenge is this. Get up one half hour, just half an hour early each day. Between now and the end of October, it's only three weeks. Spend half an hour with God. You will watch your life change by the end of the month. Have a great week. Amen.